Hello everyone. This is the Ophthalmology Business Podcast where we help you develop your ideal practice with help of other doctors and experts. The topics we cover include marketing, management, leadership, recruitment, HR, mindsets and more. I am Narain Arul Raja, the founder and one of the co-hosts of this podcast. Every listener of this podcast is welcome to join the Ophthalmology Business Academy www.obacademy.org. The membership is on us and it's our gift to you. Today I'm excited to talk to Dr. Paul Pender, Director of Digital Health Communication at Wixtra Health. And the topic we're going to be talking about is looking back looking ahead before i get started uh, dr paul why don't you take a minute or two tell me a little bit about yourself well i think uh, having retired from ophthalmology in 2019 uh, it, it gives me some time to reflect and uh, so looking back uh, i would say i really enjoyed 38 years of clinical practice was involved with some of the original fda clinical trials using eczema lasers for refractive surgery. And uh, I really enjoyed my practice. It was in Manchester, New Hampshire, in Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, opened the first ambulatory surgery center in our state and felt like, you know, I could deliver care in my community in the best way I could imagine. So uh, it was only really after I retired and started to um, take up writing that I connected with the CEO of a healthcare startup who asked me to be his uh, director of digital health communications. So that's what I've been involved in lately. That's awesome. So you have a long career, you have a lot of wisdom. So this topic, looking back and looking ahead, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, the practice of medicine in general and ophthalmology specifically is changing. Based on your experience as a clinical ophthalmologist, what do you see the future? But also kind of tell us how it's changing. Well, um, I'm dating myself, but I was also the first surgeon to perform refractive surgery. And so we've seen it go from infancy with radial keratotomy to uh, much more sophisticated uh, diagnostics and therapeutics that include uh, eczema lasers and some uh, other femtosecond lasers. But really, um, the, the field has, has continued to grow and prosper. And part of it is due to the symbiotic relationship, I think, between researchers and industry. So I think that will continue to uh, work uh, for uh, American medicine in particular. But also, if there's money to be made, uh, there will be there will be people who will find ways of uh, advancing the technology. Now, what I will also add is that uh, having spent a lot of time uh, in clinical practice, I see that clinical practice is moving towards other alternative payment models. And the American system has been subject to federal uh, types of programs. Uh, these are formula, formulas for uh, providing greater value uh, rather than volume of uh, procedures. And there's just going to be more of that that ophthalmologists will face in the future. Makes sense. Um, our audience is looking for tips because, I mean, as you know, our podcast is the business podcast, right? Ophthalmology business podcast. Uh, they are looking for tips to improve business practices as well as clinical expertise. What would you suggest that optim ophthalmologists discuss with their practice manage managers to meet the challenges of value-based ophthalmology care, but also define what value-based ophthalmology care is and then talk about, yeah, you know, how can um, the owners of these practices, the clinicians, um, you know, really work effectively with the practice managers to meet the challenges of value-based ophthalmology? So let's actually use a simple definition that Value-based care is being reimbursed for uh, desired outcomes in episodes of care. So, uh, for example, um, the patient who has uh, cataract 
is evaluated, operated on uh, after they've uh, agreed to the uh, procedure. They make their selection about uh, what their choices are for the type of lens implant they have. They then are going to be followed up for their post-operative care. And for that entire episode, uh, then payment will be determined by all those who had inputs into that care. So it could be the optometrist making the referral, the ophthalmologist. It could have, have to do with uh, basically covering the some of the costs of the technical help that's part of that. Uh, episode of care, and then um, and then it really involves being able to partner with um, other clinicians who have some skin in the game. So uh, it it will wind up becoming, I think, a, a more dominant form of reimbursement in in the states than fee for service, in my opinion. So you think people will uh, want to pay for results as opposed to outcomes, as opposed to... Uh, yeah, certainly. And, and I think that um, we, we've seen uh, federal programs um, stress uh, quality of care issues, and you check different boxes to show that you've met certain, um, I guess, measurements for quality. Um, you know, it, it became somewhat onerous, I must say. And and I can remember a, a, a very funny line from one of my technicians when I told her that I'd spent my entire lunch hour going through my quality measures. And she said, oh, is that the new weight loss plan? <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, I sort of felt like, well, wait a minute. Why, why am I having to do all this extra work? You know, right. and fortunately, I hired a scribe and I've, I, I, I basically trained her on the sorts of things that I would do. Uh, I would dictate findings to her, uh, and she obviously worked in strict confidence with me. But, um, yeah, so then I would translate uh, when I was done so that the patient would understand what they're facing and, and what the plan was, and then answer any questions. But, yeah, so I think what value-based care is going to amount to, I believe, is uh, greater cooperation among people who have different inputs into this particular episode of care, whether it be cataract surgery, could be a uh, cardiac treatment. And one of the examples I sent to you really had to do with the dilemma that is being faced by cardiologists. And let me just try to um, summarize it as best I can. So we realized that in all the billings for um, cardiac catheterization, about half of them may be medically unnecessary. Now, why is that? Well, maybe it depends on your definition of chest pain. Does it, does it involve true angina where exercise makes it worse or people get um, uh, shortest of breath and other, other factors? But really, when you look at the number of patients who get uh, cardiac cath, about half of them do not show uh, si significant enough coronary artery occlusion to justify having gone through the procedure. So you may have to look back further, looking back, again, the title of our, our little discussion here, looking back to find out what were the clinical data points that sort of created this journey for a patient to ultimately have to have an invasive procedure. and is it possible that in half the cases, if you intervened earlier or subjected the patient earlier to diet, exercise, and other recommendations, then perhaps you wouldn't have to face that invasive procedure. So the value to that proposition is that you spared half those people from undergoing the morbid morbidity and possible mortality of an invasive procedure, and you've saved who's ever paying for that care uh, on a fair amount of money for those people who do not have to have that procedure. Now that also requires large data sets. Mm -hmm. So this is an data. example of how do you create value while reducing cost, correct? But it also requires, as, you'll, as you can imagine, large uh, 
a large cohort of patients to be able to look at their clinical journey and to be able to sort of organize by demographics, their lab values and what have you, is to be able to look at a profile and say, oh, in this situation, perhaps we should do this instead of jumping right into the cath lab. So I, I think the value is, is <laughs> it's, it's saving money to the system. It's also saving the patients from having to undergo things that may prove to be medically unnecessary. Right. Now, so I assume you're, you're referring to things like artificial intelligence to make those recommendations, or would it be people who are making those recommendations? I think, I think what, what you wind up doing is being able to use uh, what fire-enabled uh, technology to tap into electronic health records. And those uh, requirements now to be able to um, to access uh, patient data with permission is now going to be required by um, the federal government. And so there are companies out there seeking to not only collect data, scrub it, de-identify it, but also use large numbers to be able to track trends and to perhaps uh, show where there's a chances for, for a different type of intervention before you have to go to do something that's more extreme. So I think that artificial intelligence may offer part of the solution, but someone has to be actually asking the right clinical questions that you wanna answer uh, to be able to make this something that's gonna be very beneficial. So you have physicians, who can ask the right clinical questions and the, and the tech people who will be able to then uh, harness that information to their own searches. Makes sense. Uh, the word, you know, wasteful or the phrase wasteful spending is, is used a lot in healthcare, right? Uh, you hear it almost every day, like the idea of, you know, hey, how can we cut these wasteful spending, et cetera, et cetera. Now you have, you know, almost four decades of experience as a clinician and also as an as an advisor to a startup, you know, who's working on this area. Like, what have you learned, um, you know, with regards to wasteful spending? Is it true? Can it actually be cut? Like, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think the first thing you, you can do is try to keep people healthy enough so that they won't go to urgent care centers in the hospital. And uh, I'll use the example of diabetes. Is it because urgent care is the most expensive part of healthcare? Well, it, it, yeah, I think what happens is that there, there may be other ways to be able to intervene uh, without having the patient go to urgent care or the emergency room. And, and we talked about this earlier uh, before the recording started about the importance of having a primary care doctor who can manage and coordinate your care. And so many people who hit the emergency rooms don't have someone uh, that they can rely on to be able to, uh, I guess you could say, uh, be a traffic cop when necessary to be able to look at what needs to be done. So I think if you talk about un unnecessary expenses, let's think uh, about the case of diabetes. So if, if uh, an employer hires someone who hasn't had a primary care doctor, but has a family history of diabetes, what they really need is a good medical workup and evaluation to start. But if they have diabetes and it's proven on a physical exam and laboratory results, then really what you're trying to do is get them in the loop so that they're going to have a, a dilated eye exam every year. And all the health insurance companies have that as one of their quality criteria that they're held, held accountable for that a diabetic needs to have a, a dilated ocular examination once a year. So, and by doing that and keeping the patient in the loop and, and following up and making sure they keep their appointments and what have you, you can then prevent a lot of really bad things happening, not just with vision, but uh, people who have uncontrolled diabetes also suffer uh, from vasculopathy, problems with their extremities, uh, their kidneys, you name it, heart problems. So by, by essentially um, doing the basic stuff early, you can often prevent the more serious things from occurring way down the road. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question as we come to a close. Um, can you give us an example or two where doctors can act uh, in this in this unique situation where they can help reduce costs? Like in other words, uh, like as a, as a as a person who's kind of like the the, the traffic cop who's making sure that you know the right people are going to the right you know lanes. Right. I I think if we can stay on diabetes for a little while, mm -hmm. I think that's helpful in a setting where uh, primary care doctors are available. Uh, they can coordinate care with uh, specialists by referral systems. And uh, there may also be uh, ways in which people at more distance uh, in rural areas, for example, may be able to have uh, photos taken of their retina to look for evidence of diabetic retinopathy that can then be uh, evaluated through artificial intelligence and those patients then can be brought in sooner before uh, they have more problems. I think um, the whole idea about collaboration, it really is saying to yourself, well, what is best for the patient right now, right here? And if you have colleagues in, in uh, across the, the spectrum of medical care and uh, mental and behavioral care, then you're, you're gonna be able to have better outcomes. Instead of having silos of information and silos of, of visits, they're all gonna be coordinated and, and the patient will not be abandoned. I think part of the reason why uh, there's so much distrust in healthcare is because the patients feel like no one's listening to them. And, I think when you show the patient that you care, you're listening to them, they are being heard. Now they feel they can trust their, their care. And if you also have someone who's designated to be that person who can serve as a patient advocate that can actually make sure that the right care gets to the right people at the right time, then you really have something that should be successful. One of the ways that I think we're gonna see reduction in cost is when you can reduce the impact of intermediaries. And one example I'll give you before we close has to do with the kinds of rebates that uh, pharmacy benefit managers are able to extract from uh, employer uh, health benefits plans. And these rebates are often pocketed by, by the original health insurance company that set up the that set up the pharmacy benefit to begin with. And, and you, if you ask employers, well, what are you paying for and how are you paying for it? Oftentimes it's it's a it's a blank sheet. They don't even know what they're paying for. And so when you work with a company like ours is uh, with a pharmacy benefits that's essentially providing the drug at cost and not at a commission, plus only a small handling charge. And it doesn't matter whether it's a $20 drug or a $2,000 drug, that, that drug essentially is provided for that patient with only a markup just for handling and, and essentially subscription that the pharmacy company is going to have with the employer. So there are ways of, I think, uh, reducing costs in the system. And we're really excited about being able to put together something for employers that will minimize the uh, the expense of these intermediaries. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Paul Pender, for joining us today. And I really enjoyed our conversation on the topic, looking back and looking ahead. We appreciate your time today very much. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're welcome. I also want to take a moment to thank our listeners. We appreciate each and every one of you. We cannot do what we do without you. If you like our podcast, kindly share it with your friends on social media. And please don't forget to write a review on iTunes or Google Play. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners find us. Till we meet again, wishing all of you an amazing week ahead.